Dr. Richard Ernst, welcome to this Nobel interview. You come from Zurich and from a very famous school there, University, ETH, where also Albert Einstein have studied for mm -hmm. about 100 years ago. But today you are very critical to the way the university function in the society. What, what are the major drawbacks in the university system? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just two days ago giving a lecture in Luleå, in the north of Sweden, and I was showing a transparency of the gentleman you just mentioned, Einstein, and he said it's, it's one of the greatest miracles of mankind that after 20 years sitting in a school bench, one still can maintain some creativity. And I think that's indeed one of the problems that we try just to, to listen and to accumulate knowledge without doing anything. And some of the students and also the professors have lost contact with reality. I mean, I might express it in a little bit too extreme way, but I think it's a tendency and we should try to get more into contact with reality. What, what do you mean by contact with reality? Uh, in, there are different aspects. First of all, I mean, the necessities of life so that we orient our research projects to what really mankind is needing, the relation between north and south, between the, the super rich and the super poor. That's one aspect. And the other aspect is that we also try to develop, develop more responsibility for what is going on in the world. I mean, in the moment, the world is, so to say, governed by politicians and by industry. And both, they have urgent problems to solve today, to, to survive for tomorrow. And I think we need somebody who is looking more into the future on long terms. And I mean, we have been granted freedom to do essentially what we want, but whoever has uh, acquired freedom, he also has to accept responsibility. So we have essentially to do what is needed to be done. And this is long-range planning, long-range planning on a global scale, that we really try to develop new concepts. How can we um, safely survive also in the future? So you, you mean this would be a task for a community of scientists all over the world? Yeah, it's exactly, that's true. Not a, a single individual can do that. We don't need specialists for that political science. Of course, it's important of, of futurology or whatever you'd like to call it. That's fine to have a few specialists, but I think everybody should be concerned and one needs to collaborate and work together in order to, to develop new concepts. And it means essentially that we have to, to work as a scientist on two levels. I mean, first of all, we have to do our detailed work. We have to concentrate on, on our details and go as deep as we can into the ground, deep and deep to the foundations so that we have solid foundations to build our future on. But on the other side, we should also work on an upper level and, and develop wits and foresight and have global views for what is going on in the world. So these two levels, they should essentially work side by side. Um, what, why do you think that scientists can be, what I say, better moral leaders in the world than other people? Yeah, I mean, they, they are not. But again, what, what I said before, Politicians, for example, they are so much in their business and they, they, they can't afford. I mean, they have to, have to survive personally uh, in the next election, for example. And uh, business people, their profits and the shareholder value is so important that they can't have this long-term vision. So, I mean, universities are essentially left for... Uh, uh, taking such a job. Of course, we are not particularly well suited for it, perhaps, because we are so uh, 
specialists and have been trained as specialists, but still I think we are those who, who should develop these ideas and especially because we are actually training the, the leaders of the future. So you mean that this obligation is because scientists are teachers? Yeah, exactly. So it's in education. Yeah, I mean, not... teaching and research is always connected in most countries. And the separation of the two, I don't think it's good. What, what do other people, your colleague scientists, say when you tell them that you have to take more responsibility for the long-term thinking in the world? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they say it's nice talking. It's easier, easier to talk about it than to do it. But that's, I'm aware of that. And they don't completely disagree, but they try to ignore it. Hmm. People are busy with their own Yeah, they're very clients. busy. They say, I mean, how can we have, uh, take on more responsibility than already? We are already completely saturated with tasks. Well, what about students? Aren't, aren't they broad-minded? That's true. The, the student, if I talk like that in front of, of, of an audience and the students afterwards come to me and say, oh, that's great and we, we thank you for these ideas. I mean, that's exactly how we feel. So the students, they are very motivated for that. The professors, they just see their own limits. But the students, they would like to, to get more involved in that. I mean, you see, it's so difficult today to motivate young students to go in, into the sciences, chemistry in particular. We don't have enough chemistry students. But I mean, if one would combine the detailed science with, with a broader view, I think we could also motivate bright young students with a broad mind to, to study natural sciences again. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that young students, that people don't go into sciences today? I think one reason is that it's become so specialized and so detached from, from the human interests. I mean, if you are married, it's so difficult even to tell your wife what you're doing. And she might not care and might not understand and doesn't want to understand. So, I mean, you need something in common with other people as well to, to, to be part of, of a community. And otherwise, if you are just a, a group of specialists, of course, I have friends everywhere in the world in different cities who understand me and who understand my language. But, I mean, you need also people like that in your immediate environment. If we come back to the research that you have done, you have developed an, an instrument, an MR spectroscopy, uh, that is used broadly by both chemists and biologists. Did you have any idea that this apparatus would work in this way? Not really. At the beginning, I, I didn't see the power of it. But I mean, it was always my goal. It was my goal to develop something which could be used afterwards. And in essence, I'm not really what one would imagine to be a, a and a scientist who wants to understand the world, um, to understand how the basic principles of, of a human being. I was more interested in, in really designing tools. So I'm a tool maker and not really a scientist in this sense. And I wanted to provide other people with the capabilities of, of solving problems. So to, what, what, was this the motivation for you to go into the university and study chemistry, to be useful um, for this? Not really. I mean, initially, I mean, I once discovered in our old house a, a box of chemicals when I was 13 and I started to play with this box of chemicals and I survived and our house survived. And so... I became very interested in this phenomena, this strange phenomena of chemistry. And, and at that time, I really wanted to gain understanding. So at that time, I, I had more a scientific motivation. And for this reason, I went into chemistry. But later on, I developed more in that direction of a tool maker. Yes, and, and uh, you have also an interest in art, but it's a very special kind of art, especially. Yeah. What is it? Uh, that's Tibetan art. Shall I show you a picture? 
Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, I think in, in general, the combination of science and art is a, a unique and important one. I mean, the, often one says that somebody who doesn't grow up and maintains some of his useful attitudes, he either becomes a scientist or, in the best case, an artist. I mean, these are the people who have to, to be in some way naive and ask simple questions and think differently than the rest of mankind. And so I think it's a natural uh, combination, science and arts. And initially it was mostly music, which I was interested in. And then later on, I developed an interest for the painting arts and by accident I got into contact with this Tibetan art where these, these very beautiful uh, paintings are being done which I'm fascinated of which have I mean first of all uh, it's it's very high high art perfectly done and secondly it expresses a philosophy, a, a very strange philosophy for me, but I mean, if you go into it and study it in, in more detail, you see how, how fascinating this, this kind of philosophy, this Buddhist philosophy actually is and how much it can give us Western people. And so I, I gained a lot from that. And I think there, there was cross talk between what I'm doing during the day and what I could look at at home uh, in the evening. I think it was important for me to have these two sides available. I'm afraid our time is out. So thank you for taking your time to, for this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interview. <laughs>